Hello and welcome to this Art of Smart Roundtable, which is one of a three-part series titled Growth Tactics, How to Lead in the Digital Age. I'm Oliver Pickup, a London-based technology and business journalist, and I'm thrilled to be your host and moderator today as we explore the topic of how to rebuild a brand following the global reset. How and why has the importance of branding evolved? How can brands be built from the inside out? And what are the top tips for building a new strategy? To help answer these questions and more, I'm delighted to be joined by three incredible leaders. Wayne Clark, founding partner of the Global Growth Institute, Linda Dupont Blackshaw, Global Marketing Director of Crow Global, and Tom Grinier, Group CEO at the British Medical Association. For context, this project is a collaboration between Crow Global and the Global Growth Institute that takes a close look at what growth means for businesses in 2021 and beyond. In this world of constant change, uncertainty is inevitable, but mastering it is an art. The pandemic has forced organizations to accelerate their digital transformation journeys and evolve their ways of working, recruiting, and communicating. To survive, thrive, and generate lasting value, leaders have had to change their mindsets, rethink business models, and reevaluate what growth means. According to Crow's Art of Smart methodology, Growth is one of the four factors that help business leaders make better, smarter decisions. We hope this three-part roundtable series informs, inspires, and influences members of the C-suite around the world. The highlights of this session and the two other related roundtables in which we consider how to recruit for growth in a hybrid working world, and also what achieving growth through adaptability and resilience means in 2021, they'll be written up on the Art of Smarts online hub. So we'll kick off the session by asking how and why has the importance of branding evolved? Absolutely. Um, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you all today. Um, <clears throat> branding uh, really has gone through a huge evolution um, around this time of a global pandemic. And I think one thing that stands out, certainly from what we did at Crow, um, three years ago, ago we rebranded, um, and I know that's the date because it's the day I gave birth to my daughter, <laughs> three years to the date. Um, so when we rebranded, what we were looking for was we were looking to do better. We knew that our brand had to evolve. And we knew that we had to look at that and check in on it all the time or regularly. But I don't think we quite anticipated that the brand was alive. And that is really important, that it, it's living and breathing and it is, it is connected to lots of other living things. So our people, the environment, all of these things changing our products, our services. And so that constant living piece means that it needs to be constantly moving. And I think what COVID-19 has done is really just probably exploded that and brought that really onto the scene. Um, and I think in a time where everybody is uncertain, there is political uncertainty, economic uncertainty, um, depending on where you're living at the moment in the UK, we've got uncertainty of whether we can get fuel today. There's lots of uncertainty going on in the world. Um, and, I, and I think really people are looking for trusted brands. They're looking to pin their, um, <clears throat> their thoughts, their beliefs, their ethics onto brands. And that's giving brands a much bigger remit than they used to have. So I think that trust piece has become a really big issue. And I think recognizing that the brand is living and constantly has to evolve and be relevant is key. Um, and I think there's some mishaps that you could really do, you know, that, that could really sort of scupper that. Uh, and one of them is really maybe responding too quickly. And, and I think some brands in, in this time have, they've had that knee jerk reaction, something big's happened, we've got to be responsive, let's move now. And they actually haven't taken that time to listen Certainly at Crow, um, our management committee met regularly. And one of the things I think we said very early on is this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. We need to keep checking in regularly. Every week we need to talk about this, but we need to look at the long term view. Um, so I think that's a, a really, a really big piece of the brand right now. That's a great way to start things off there, Linda. So thank you very much for that. And, and Tom, I mean, you, you became group CEO uh, the BMA, July 2019. It's It's been a real, you know, you've had a, a very challenging time, if we're honest. So could you talk to us a little bit about your experiences 
Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, again, thanks for the opportunity. And it's great to be here with Wayne and Linda um, in this small world we live in. Crow are actually the internal auditors at um, the BMA and are actually helping us with some of what we've done, uh, including looking at our um, COVID um, preparedness. And just when I arrived in uh, July 2019 at the BMA, I think it's fair to say uh, the organisation had been through a difficult time and um, little were we to know that within a matter of a few months, uh, certainly I'd never heard the word COVID, um, before um, our entire world was going to change. And one of the things that attracted me to the BMA was, I think, the really compelling mission statement that the BMA has. We look after doctors so they can look after you. It really is clear, crisp and simple. So when the COVID pandemic really started to shake us and from as early as January 2020, we were starting to think, well, there could be more to this than perhaps previous um, global health scares and the way they'd impacted in the UK. By February, that was coming very clear. By early March, um, we were instigating, little did we know it was still to be going on um, 18 months later, but we instigated a uh, initially a, a weekly, very quickly, it was three times a week. And then by the time we got late March into April, it was, um, we were meeting every morning at 8.30. Um, and over the weekends, it absolutely consumed us. And just picking on some of the, uh, I think really key points Linda was making, one of the things that we had to watch against was knee-jerk reactions. But the other we had to moderate that with was our mission statement. So one of the things that really shook us was late March, early April. We started to hear for the first time that PPE was running short. And we had to make sure we understood what that meant because we'd been supportive of the government and the government's permission up until then. But what we were going to come out and say in the national press, because we felt we needed to make this known, um, our members needed to see we had their backs. But equally importantly, um, hospital acquired COVID um, was um, a coming term. And we needed to make sure patients were protected as well. And whether whoever in hospital were unwittingly spreading um, COVID. So we took the decision really based on our mission statement that we had to go out and say there is a PPE issue here. We didn't do that lightly and I genuinely believe it was the right thing to do and I think given our post bag and given the both the media response but I think more importantly the response from members and other healthcare organisations it was important that we stood up and did that and then at other key times um, throughout the COVID uh, last 18 months that mission statement really helped us position when we had to speak truth to power, when we had to stand up for our members. And crucially, the BMA is both the doctor's trade union, it's also a professional association. And that's that second bit. We look after doctors so they can look after you. So going out there advocating for society. So we were the first major organisation, I think it was the front page of the Sunday Telegraph, um, that reported that we were calling for um, masks to be mandatory inside. We took a view on whether schools should go back. We took a view on lockdown and easing of lockdown and then re-entering lockdown uh, last autumn and Christmas. We took a view around um, vaccination, in particular vaccination of healthcare workers with that mission statement really front and centre. I mean, it's, it's really interesting to have that as a touchstone and, and you know, no one can deny uh, the difficult, you know, path you've had to tread, Tom, um, you know, in the last 18 months in particular. I think, you know, uh, the first 10 doctors were, were non, non-white, for example, and, and you, you know, given the the George Floyd uh, murder, which which sparked the, or, or really sort of gave momentum to the Black Lives Movement. There's so many political issues now uh, that, that, you know how I'm just interested, Wayne. Perhaps we can bring you in here. How, what advice would you give to leaders? How, um, well, not politicised, but but how uh, reactionary should they be? What should they offer here, and in, in, in terms of looking after the brand as well? 
I guess for me, the main thing right now is is understand where people are at. And I think that that's that's like a huge issue, right? So I'll give you a, a very current example, I think, for all of us. Yesterday, I was waiting in line for petrol. I managed to get some, actually, in North London. It's pretty good. But I'm waiting in line for petrol for an hour. And I was thinking about there's an organization we work with, and I've just seen them on LinkedIn. They're a big transportation organization. They've just been talking about their new values, right? which is wonderful. They've got these four new values. It's very lovely. And they've got banner stands showing them off and whatnot. And then I was thinking, you know, if, if I'm sitting there and I was watching the, the anger of people in the queue was, was quite something, you know, it was quite a tense environment to be in. And I'm thinking, you know, you've got concerns about COVID for most people and their families. You've got concerns about, you know, out of control inflation, concerns about what's going on with the economy, um, concerns about, you know, getting petrol. And people have got these huge issues and on top of all of that, the organization is out there talking about their values. And I'm not saying that values aren't a great thing. I'm a huge advocate. My world is spent in employee engagement and values and culture and whatnot. But it feels like a real mismatch between where people are at and what the organization is actually talking about. And, and you know, it, we've got to probably rewind back about 30 or so years into the mid 90s to get back to a time where human beings, most of them didn't have mobile phones. And at that point, the subject or the ideal or ideology of internal communications probably made sense because it was internal. After we got phones, there's no such thing as internal anymore. So the idea that these organizations or brands can separate the internal from the external had been gone for years. And I think, you know, they just needed a bit more sensitivity in how they were talking to their audience. And I think that's the main thing. It's just to get a sense of where your people are at and understand where they are. I saw this wonderful advert for, um, it was for Gymshark, you know, and there's lots of positive stuff about how they represent and talk about the brand, but it was this lovely book and it showed someone inside Gymshark opening up the book. And it said something along the, it's bad, it's not, I haven't got the right wording, something along the lines of that Gymshark is about belonging. So, you know, they've certainly got a handle on the culture and are speaking to what people would empathise with and understand because they, they're in tune. So I think, again, some organisations are really in tune to how people are feeling and others are totally mis, you know, disconnected from the popular emotion that's out there in their organisation. Well, I think um, there's a great stat from um, GGI, an exclusive stat here that says 57% of managers do not think their organization's vision is something that excites and energizes everyone. And I think that's a really interesting insight there. So almost, you know, two thirds of managers um, are not excited by the vision. And, and I think, you know, would you, to what extent would you agree, Linda, with, with Wayne's assessment that at the moment, you know, employee uh, em, employees are more worried about a sort of having, creating a sense of belonging than values and and, um, and things like that. I really agree. I think wholeheartedly you, 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 you're spot on there, uh, Wayne. And I, and I think I'm not surprised that a large percentage of employees, our people are not engaged. And, and I know Tom, you were talking earlier about a mission statement and, and, and yours sounds really good and, and really authentic. And that's exactly where it needs to be. But I do think with a lot of businesses, they're still following a very old formal, um, <clears throat> old school mission statement, which is about five sentences long, um, very concise, doesn't connect with anybody in the business apart from the leaders. And if you asked anybody in the business outside of the leaders, most people wouldn't know what that was. And I think that's a problem. And I think that disconnect that you're talking about, Wayne, is absolutely there. And I think when I was talking at the beginning about a brand breathing and being alive, I mean, that's every minute of every day. We are now living, brands are now living in micro minute, you know, microseconds. They, they're literally every single um, moment that something can be seen. And we're not a 1D anymore. We're 3D uh, from every angle and even the angles we might not know about. And that's why authenticity has to be there. Otherwise, there's no way you can control all of this. <laughs> there's no way, you know, your people are speaking, they're looking at you online, offline, social media, in their, in their downtime when they're working. Clients, contacts, stakeholders are looking all different ways. There's no way you can control that. So I think if you're authentic and you have maybe more than a mission statement, also a, a purpose, uh, it's got to be very highly aligned to that mission statement. 
I think then you're you're on your way to to being more relevant and having better engagement. And and hopefully some of those people who didn't know what the mission statement was would be more interested in it. Um, But I think there is a big disconnect. And I think thinking that a mission statement is this piece of paper that is sat with a board that people read is, is wrong. And it has to be, you know, Tom talked about when they were making decisions, they were going back to that because it's authentic and it's anchoring them. And anchoring right now is really important. But I think the vision is important as well because people need to know they can grow with an organisation. You know, we've got this, the great resignation happening now. People are feeling like they're not connected and they don't want to be connected in one place. They want to be connected every time this very uncertain landscape we're working in moves. So I think, you know, revamping that mission statement to be something much more relevant and modern, which it sounds like what Tom has done um, at BMA, is really where you want to be and you need that aligned with some of the other things you're talking about otherwise people just aren't going to connect I, I think yeah I think what's coming through loud and clear is, is is that authenticity and need for trust and across a number of channels it's difficult how you know how how do we get that consistency um, I, I think perhaps I'll leave that hanging there for a moment I'll bring you in uh, Tom um, there are a couple of great quotes. I don't think this one's yours. I think it was from one of your colleagues. But when you all moved online, there was a great quote um, about you were further apart, but you'd never been cl- uh, closer together, which I really loved. And also there's this idea of, you know, boxes on a, a Zoom or a team yeah. screen being democratizing people and, and, and making you lose that hierarchy. I think I think that's entirely right. And uh, no, when we first went into lockdown, we took the view, uh, picking up on Linda's point, we couldn't communicate with our staff enough, even if it was saying we don't know. We appreciated the BMA representing 160,000 doctors and medical students had a crucial role to play. We didn't know exactly what that role was going to be, but we knew it was going to be important. We um, appreciated that our staff, including myself, nobody knew what was going to happen next. And um, I've been absolutely open in all staff meetings that COVID obviously does not come with any sort of crystal ball. And trying to predict the questions about when are we going back to the office? Well, I think we were targeting uh, July 2020, we're still speaking to each other in little boxes. And um, so when we first went into lockdown, we just were communicating, supportive messaging. If we didn't know, we were absolutely upfront and said we didn't know, but I felt it was really important that the staff knew that we were thinking about this. The staff were naturally worried about what it would mean in terms of going into hospital settings, GP settings to represent members. And so one of the things that we wanted to do, we just moved to um, all staff surveys, moving from the annual traditional pulse check, sorry, annual traditional survey to much more of a pulse checking of survey. And um, there was an element we could tailor ourselves as well as the benchmark questions. And one of the questions we really wanted to know is, do you have the equipment to do the uh, do your job at home? And we got a score of, I don't know, some eight, 8.1, something like that, which pretty good but I wanted to drive that up and so we said to staff well up to 50 quid get it yourself anything else we'll get it for you we want you to be able to not have to worry and I think one of the things um, that leaders do need to always remember I'm doing this in a little box room Um, I've got garden and uh, what we also need to remember is reading those pull surveys you can send me as many telephones desks and chairs and whatever I haven't got room. I'm sitting doing my job on a bed with a laptop in my on my knees and in shared accommodation. Or if my partner's on the computer, I can't be. And we had to work with those members of staff to really bring them um, as much as we could and recognising that for some staff, there were individual circumstances, whether it was caring needs or other needs. And one of the things that I emphasised was a safe staff first approach. And um, certainly from looking at the staff surveys, that seems to have gone down well. But then the the other thing was then all staff meetings, which were 
they were fairly well rated beforehand. I could have probably lived with higher ratings. Going into lockdown, we put real emphasis in all staff meetings. Uh, we'd have 80% plus joining on live, watching live, certainly at the outset. And um, I think our worst rated all staff meeting since going into lockdown is still better than our best rated all staff meeting. And that democratising quote about the screens everybody's equal and you know I, 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 it happened on this call um wi-fi cuts out it disappears and um you make the most of it and um gordon our head of internal comms who chairs our all staff meetings i think was uh cursing me twice for dropping out but didn't do it on purpose but i think it's good that everybody sees we're all living with the same frustrations and uh, you know there is a there is a a leveling aspect to that um, I, I think, um, um, don't worry about the Wi-Fi, Tom, that's great. I think it adds a bit of a rawness and, and you know, keeps it real. Um, but I think, I'm just wondering, Linda, you know, as, as um, with Crow being a global organisation, um, how easy stroke difficult is it to ha- navigate um, the necessary communications and also making everyone kind of feel um, as though they're safe and, and they belong? It's really hard. It's really hard. And I think um, picking up on some of what Tom said is is there's a lot of listening that needs to be done. Um, We don't have all the answers. Um, We lean on our brand a lot. We lean on our brand. um, What we try and do at Crow is we try and behave our brand. It's it's very intentional, our behaviours, and they, they are around our brand and those core values and purposes. Um, And I I think that helps hold everybody together or at least bring them to a certain point. After that, I think from a global perspective, it's very difficult for us all to make sure that everybody's in the right place or the same place is impossible. Um, Certainly if we look at areas, some of our regions, you know, we're seeing some points we've got um, some areas which really hadn't been affected by COVID, for example, and others that were in the midst of, of, of what can only be described as, as, as just sheer hell. Um, and then that swapped around the next week. And then on top of that, we just have different economic and political um, and, and organisations are, are set up differently in different, in different areas. So recognising that and trusting our people to know best uh, in certain circumstances was really important. Um, so part of when we bring people in, we make sure they're aligned to our brand. You know, that's something we're really looking for is people who who want to live and breathe and, and have in, intent on our brand. And so even if the area for Latin America is, is, is very different space right now and in a very different situation to Western Europe, um, we understand there's some core values that bring us together, some core purpose but we trust that what they're doing may be slightly different locally because they know best. And I, and I think that flexibility within a brand, that's where success happens. I mean, the idea that everybody has to be sort of in straight jackets and everybody's exactly the same is never going to work. Again, I go back to it being living and breathing that, you know, you have to have something that brings you all together and it's got to be authentic. Um, and I think that really sings to what Tom's saying. It's really authentic. Some of those decisions are really hard, it sounds like, and I wouldn't have wanted to be there making that decision, Tom, but it sounds like, you know, they were honest and you've been honest. I don't have the answers right now, but we're thinking about this. We will collaborate if we need to. We will look outside if we need to, but we recognise what you're, what's going on there and we recognise that you will tell us if this is not correct. So listening and, and really trusting, I think, comes into play. And a lot of those softer emotional skills those softer skills which you know I think CEOs and boards are are really looking out for now and they have much more value in the marketplace than they did pre-COVID. Um, it, fantastic points Linda I'm just wondering Wayne if, if in the last you know 18 months or so ha- have there been uh, more people focused on their personal brands and have to what extent have have businesses leveraged that? I mean, I, I saw it, I think it's accelerated. So COVID has definitely been an accelerant of that. I think before COVID, I saw the trend start to shift massively. And I'm, I'm from a world where I spent the first 
12 years of my career working for accountancy firms. So sort of drummed into you all the time is client confidentiality and, you know, be very careful what you say and whatnot. So every time I go out and do like a client visit, I'll go on, you know, I'll do something on LinkedIn afterwards. I'll make a short video and saying, oh, I've just been at this great manufacturing company today and you should see what they're doing. It's amazing stuff. And then what will happen is about two hours after, I'll get like the CEO of that company go on to my LinkedIn post and say, Wayne, it was great to have you today. I thought I was trying to keep you secret. Then I realized, of course, you don't want the secrecy because you want the attention. You know, everyone does. And, and that's partly, let's be honest, it's partly about the organizational brand and it's partly about the individual brand. I think everyone's become more consciously aware of their own brand. And obviously you're in a world where not to stray into the digital currency space, but, you know, Bitcoin in its ultimate sort of definition is about personal sovereignty of wealth. It's the opportunity for individuals to own their wealth in a way that's non-confiscatable. And there's and there's a big thing around that, I, I think, is a parallel around brand. One interesting thing I saw at the uh, Met Gala, not that I was there, of course, but watching it on TV, it was quite interesting, was you've got these huge stars that are, you know, attracting a lot of attention from the organised paparazzi press, but the people who were really getting all the attention were the YouTubers. And I think it up, there was a story that upset a lot of the A-list stars that you've got these actors and amazing musicians. And then along comes a YouTuber with like a few million, you know, uh, subscribers and takes all of the attention because the kids already want their picture taken with the YouTubers. And un people have understood the power of individual branding, the value that actually with the channels available that moves with you. And I think this is definitely, um, you know, fed into and is societal, is societal change. So people aren't immune from that in business. I think people are very aware of that in business and, and are very conscious about building their brands, which is why I think having the brand that aligns with what you think is your personal brand and therefore does being aligned with this brand make me more or less valuable, I think is a really interesting thing. You know, we've got, I won't say who they are, but we've got one organization, actually I'll say what they do because then it will make sense, but one organization we spoke to and they said they, you know, they're a tobacco company. Now they can't get people to apply. As soon as people find out from the... Um, from the search agent that it's actually a tobacco company, most people reject it and say, no, thank you. But they understand the impact of their personal brand. You know, this people are very aware of that. So, so I think it's a huge thing. And I think to Tom, you know, what Tom was talking about and to sort of massively paraphrase in terms of Tom, the clarity of your purpose, I think is brilliant. There's very few organizations, and Linda, you said this, that nail it in such a succinct way. And also it speaks to a very human um, desire and trait and want to do good, do something good and do good by other human beings. I think many organizations struggle with that because they're so far away from that purpose. They try to connect with people in that way, but it just doesn't work. Linda, did you want to come in here? Yes, Wayne, I, I, was, I was loving what you said about the Met Gala, and I, and I think you're absolutely right. And, and something I was reading about recently, and it just really made me think about the massive shift change we've seen with brands and organizations, which is it used to be the organization owned and controlled that brand. They could control it. They were the power. And I think what we've seen is a three, you know, you know, 360 shift, which is now that the, the employees, the people own that brand and they make that brand. And you said earlier, Wayne, which is, which is great about if you can align your own personal brand or what I like to call it is, is reputational brand. If you can align your reputational brand with the business you're going to, then you are really valuable because that means that you are pushing that brand out and you are going to grow that brand. And if there's a good leader there, they're going to see that and they're going to say, this person is, is going to you know, walk and talk my brand every day. And I think there's been a massive shift, whereas businesses used to have all the control. But now it really is the people. And I think there's that whole thing, isn't there, about bringing your whole self to work. And that, I mean, I'm showing my age now, but if you, if you go back a few years, we never heard that. You know, you went to work, you wore, you know, you wore the standard, the standard clothing of work. You know, you, you, you tried to, if you had an accent, not have one. Um, you, you know, you tried very much to fit in to what you thought work looked like, what the brand was pushing to you. But now to bring your whole self means that really people are being much more considered when they're taking on a role because they want it to match. They want to bring their whole self. They want to bring that value. And I think it's, I, I really think it's refreshing. Uh, and I think 
you know, to have strong mission statements that we were talking about and have strong purposes and values means that people can really do that and they can they can take the control and they can they can connect with the business much better than they did before. And that's that's got to be the way of the future for brands. You've got to want to connect with the right people. Now, some people might not apply for that job, but that's okay because they weren't right to push and to grow your brand. So I think being honest to say, look, I can't be everything to all men and or women. I, I can't I can't reach every every um, every person, but I want to reach the people that align with our core values and purpose is where brands are going to want to be. Yeah, I think that's totally right. And, and um, there was just a, a, another stat, which is quite useful. This is again from, from the Global Growth Institute, um, which says that 68% of leaders say they are clear about what channels to communicate to their teams through, which obviously leaves almost a third uh, not really knowing which channels to communicate to their teams through. But maybe... Maybe, Tom, if I can come to you, there's this sort of sense of how brands can be built from the inside out. And again, referencing your mission statement, um, how, how, do you, how important is it to get this right from the you know, hiring, induction, yeah. all the way through? And, and perhaps we can talk a little bit about the importance of co-creation as well. When I went for the role at the BMA, my absolute buzz phrase was co-creation. Um, uh, in November, I spent 25 years working in different membership organisations and uh, um, the BMA is the most high profile and well known of um, the, the five membership organisations I've worked in for the last two and a half decades. And um, co-creation of all things has to be the way that you can deliver because the organization is nothing without its members and um, the flip side is without them the staff to take forward the organization's mission strategy or just to do the work um and so one of the things when again when i went the role went for the role i talked about co-creation i talked about the importance of a strategy that was understood by all and um, a co-created strategy that was co-created with the staff with the members but also, and I think really important for membership organisations, particularly those like the BMA, which is both a trade union and a professional body, um, the stakeholders. So we really involved our patient liaison group in that as well. So going back to that mission statement, we look after doctors so they can look after you. We as the staff, the doctors are the members, and you are the patients. And we did a whole series of roadshows across all four of the uh, uh, nations and uh, a couple um, in BMA House down in London and at the, at the end of one of them somebody from the technology team came up to me and said that's brilliant I now know where we fit in I now know um, for the first time really what our role is we did similar with the members um, oddly the uh, the final strategy session we did with BMA council I won't have the date exactly right but it was something like the 9th of March so um, we could still spend the day discussing strategy. Um, on it, it made up an exact minute with the beginning of March, COVID was starting to loom and starting to become the issue that we now know it was. But it just it just seems such a luxury now to think that we could spend a, spend a day discussing strategy. But thank goodness we did, because it was the last time we came together, and um, and then, then the final part was making sure that the patient voice was absolutely at the centre of that as well, because if it that if that professional activity piece is to mean anything in that second half of the mission statement about looking after you I mean you've got to involve your stakeholders so we've come up with a strategy that's got four i think really strong pillars one is an engaged membership two is then using that we can represent the members three is that we can influence on behalf of them and four we can run the bma well to deliver all of that so we've got if you like the individual, the collective, the outside world, and then the BMA as an institution. And um, peeling away from the mission statement, the strategy then, uh, to go back to your original question, how do we get that in? So we've interviewed, I inherited quite a number of interim posts. We got the strategy in place, we structured around the strategy. And then when we interviewed directors, 
But he said, there's the strategy. How are you going to deliver it? So almost they're setting out their manifesto. The strategy is absolutely front and centre. We've asked them about what are you going to do to help us deliver this collective vision which has been co-created? It's, it's, it's really clever. And I love the way that it's, you sort of tick um, all the boxes there, really. Um, obviously, it's a bit more than that. Wayne, I think you want to come in, but I, I'd, I'd like you to sort of maybe build on, on this idea of, as you, as you referred to before, uh, perhaps focusing on the kind of lower levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs right now and the need to kind of bring as many people as possible with you th through this sort of co-creation. Yeah, I think what Tom's describing, which I think is, is, a, is an excellent example, is the type of thing that we explain to nearly every CEO and leadership team around a effective and simple way to get as many people as possible to understand the strategy in the way that you understand it as the leader. And the way, that, the way to do that is through dialogue and conversation. And it's the most blindingly obvious, in a way like anti-climax sort of moment of explaining this process, because people expect there's going to be this magical thing that you're going to describe. And you say, imagine if you just talk with everyone and get them to work it out what it means for themselves. Is that it? That's it. Because the idea is most CEOs and leadership teams will spend a disproportionate amount of time discussing things like strategy and surprise, surprise, they understand them better. Your average employee or your more junior guy in an organization is rarely going to go up to a member of staff, you know, at random and say, hey, fancy getting a sandwich and talking about the future strategy of the organization, what it means for us personally. No, thank you, Wayne. <laughs> we, know, we know this is an important conversation to have because leaders have it. But rarely, if, if not, you know, it's never going to happen for someone to do that. So I think that's a really interesting thing and something very actionable from this is to try and get as many people as possible and it's a it could be a half an hour or an hour conversation and you're trying to get people to understand this on three levels in our experience what does all this mean to the organization that's really interesting what does it mean for my team that's even more interesting and so what what does all of that mean for me that's really interesting it's like you know i'm interested in what's going on in the world i'm fascinated what's going on in my street but i'm really interested in what's going on in my house yeah, so that, those sort of the levels I think most people are interested in, and you think that from a Maslow's hierarchy, again, when you get back down to the individual level, you are talking about things like safety, it's security, and it's back to some of the origins why a well-articulated strategy like Tom's and the BMAs satisfies a huge thing, which is about, is my job safe? Is my job secure? We're in a world which is totally uncertain, so I want to cling to something that feels certain and safe. Psychological safety is hugely important for most people, unless you guess you're a, too, you know, that, that, I think most human beings would be concerned about that. So I think, and how you bring that to life practically again is through, let's look at the quarterly one-to-one. -one. Maybe that's a fantastic channel every three months to have a really good structured half an hour to an hour conversation with someone, reinforce the strategy, make it meaningful for the team, make it meaningful for the individual. Uh, and then I think the way to try and get to that, if I could go one step further, even more practical, is to try and work out, in our experience, what do people want to know about, how often and through which channel? So if you talk with a member of the team, usually there, there's a reality there or an already built story, which is communications is bad. Right? So this is the big blame all in every organization and every, you know, every country we've ever been in will complain about communications. But maybe you've got an individual communication preference, which is totally subjective. So as a manager, it might be a smart idea to ask the member of the team, you know, what do you want to know about how often through which channel? That's their wants and needs. I've got stuff I need to communicate with you uh, on this kind of frequency and in this way. And then my job as a manager is to tie those two things together that we both get the best out of it. I mean, that's the, the fundamental, simple, simplistic way of describing an effective internal communication strategy and an audit, which is to satisfy both parties. So I think, you know, again, back to Maslow stuff, this is about some of the essential needs that people have. And it's impossible to try and satisfy those if you don't know what they are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Linda, I mean, if I could come to you now, that'd be great, because I know that, that, that Crow has, has worked hard to cultivate this culture of, of care. Um, and again, you know, it's difficult with it being a, such a, a global organisation. Uh, we've talked um, about the kind of power of stories. How, how, do you, how do you use that to communicate internally and externally? Um. I think the power of stories is really important and we do use it. We use it um, centrally. So Crow Global, who I'm part of, is, is, is the, the network. 
and we have members all over the world um, and speaking all different languages or from all different cultures and backgrounds. And so storytelling is something that can really trans, it, it can go across all of those. Um, and if we tell a story well, and certainly something that's happening, some experiences we're having with clients, um, things that we're seeing in the market. Um, and of course, we're on this today, the art of smart, our insights that, we, that we're, we're sharing. Um, when we talk about how we're making smart decisions and how we're engaging with people, that storytelling helps us to bring people together. So I think we see that as, as, as definitely something that, that helps. Um, just, just touching on something that Wayne said there, which is sort of connected, which is that, that manager piece uh, and, and listening. Um, and one of the ways to connect is to use that really valuable resource of managers, which is, from my experience, in many um, businesses and organisations, underutilised. And they really are the conductor of, of connecting up all of these different parts. Um, and I think they have a huge job right now. And, and in terms of a skill set, um, they really are going to have to bring their all in this sort of uncertain time. Um, and when we're telling that story, they are that linchpin, really, to connect us to everybody else. Because it is great to have that one-to-one -one all the time. But that leader, that one leader, or maybe two, can't always get out to everybody around the whole world. And so that's where we rely on those managers to get that narrative and to bring that through. Um, and that's not an easy, that's not an easy sort of position right now. Um, from my perspective, perspective what I'm seeing is it's one of the hardest jobs out there in this environment you've got a new looser working environment um, it's less structured than we know it used to be in the office it used to be quite quite known now we've got work from homes we've got work-life balances we've got condensed hours we've got people with different needs we're trying you know they're trying to be inclusive so making sure we've got all mindsets all different types of people from different types of background and that manager has got to make sure to get that smartest decision, the best decision possible. That manager has got to make sure they are engaging with the right people to get the right input. And some of them might not be in the office. Some of them might be introverts and be better off face to face or not face to face. Some of them could be um, new uh, and never met people face to face or in person, not feel the need or, or feel confident enough to, to um, challenge a decision. So I think those managers are the linchpin of, of getting that narrative out, that story, um, that storytelling, or, or that that certainly that narrative about your brand out at all times. So I think engaging with that group and make sure and making sure they have the right skills in this new age. Um, they may have had the right skills two years ago, but I think you know investing in those people right now is really where it's at. And I, of course, Wayne is going to be able to sort of uh, develop on that but I think that's that's really that really is kind of your your magic spot and your managers I, I really like that I really like how you've identified that Linda and and um I, I and yeah I think Wayne probably will will be able to help us out here uh, there was another stat uh, that is perfect for now another one from GGI that says just over uh, a third 36 percent of managers often um step back and look for uh, improvements in their team so there's a massive opportunity cost here you know th th there is a sense that perhaps managers perhaps they were overworked before but certainly now as we step into the hybrid world um they do need to be um i don't know invested in as as, as linda said and, and given more responsibility because they have uh you know a heck of a job here wayne what would you say to that well i think one of the lowest scoring questions we see in nearly every organizational survey and they will differ in how they're worded is a question which says I've got skills that the organization could use but doesn't it's, it's a commonly used question in many surveys and you're looking at how many people essentially feel underutilized and there's a lot of people so based on when I've seen this question come up time and time again in organizations on one hand you've got people that say you know I'm tremendously overworked and overwhelmed and I'm stressed out and I'm phoning EAP helplines uh, and on the other hand I am absolutely underutilized I've got all these skills and talents and experiences. I've lived a thousand lives before I came here. Unfortunately, my job title now describes me as something else and no one relates to me anymore. That, that, that sees all that stuff. Just look on my LinkedIn history timeline. I've done a bunch of stuff, but no one sees it. So I think that's, that's it's tremendous, um, tremendously frustrating for people and a huge opportunity cost for organizations because we've got all these skills and experiences that we could tap into if we had 
again, the sort of discipline of management to get into those types of conversations. I think that's that's a huge opportunity. And Wayne, if I, um, if I could stay with you, please, just thinking about um, what what are the top tips when it comes to building a new strategy? We talked a little bit about co-creation, which I love, but perhaps you can talk to us about um, the uh, after action review, which comes from the, from the US Army and, and, and perhaps how companies could use that approach. Well, yeah, we, we first came across it when I was at um, Arthur Anderson, actually. It was a guy who brought it into Arthur Anderson in, its, uh, in the late 90s when I joined. And at there, they were calling it the after action review process. And there was a guy from the US military who developed a process of asking four very simple questions that sought to transfer knowledge really quickly uh, between different military missions. And the four questions were, what was supposed to happen? What actually happened? Why was there a difference in between the two, good or bad? And what can you do differently next time? This was adopted, as we understand, by a lot of the oil companies in the 70s. BP, I think, were one of the big adopters of this methodology. And it became the knowledge management movement that I joined when I left university in the late 90s, showing my age now. But I think the brilliant thing about the questioning process, and the guy explains it, the hardest question to agree on is the first question, what was supposed to happen? So when you conduct an after action review process, the interesting thing is most people have a very different view of what reality was. So again, if you, in the way that we would test that, we go into an organization, we ask for frontline employees, uh, personal development plans over the next six to 12 months, we take a selection of them, and then we often show them to CEOs and say, have a read. And my CEOs read through these things saying, what the hell? This has got no relationship to, I thought, I thought everyone was clear we're turning left. No one knows which way we're going, but because something weird happens in between the clarity at the sort of top and then what everyone else understands it to be. But I think agreeing on what the reality is and what the direction is, is one of the most difficult things, even as simple as it sounds, which is why, again, back to, you know, people like Tom, who do a great job and his team of defining what that means to help people out is, is so important and, and way more valuable than I think people really understand. Tom, I think you want to come in there. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank, well, first of all, thank you, Wayne. Um, but secondly, I think a key part of answering that has also got to be, when you don't know, just being honest about it. And um, if you don't know the answer, and that's never been more the case in the last 18 months, we've not known all the answers. Um, you could litter the uh, proverbial whatever with um, the number of times, as I say, we'd planned to come back to work. But let's be honest about that. We were planning with best endeavours. What's more important to me is the values of why we were doing that. And if you can get across to whoever it is you're trying to explain why, and in particular why, then it has to change. That's got to be part of um, the challenge. And um, just picking up on a, a little bit of the conversation that we've, we've been having there, in particular, I think for me is looking at our new hires. And that's been really difficult in the last 18 months. Um, I had an executive assistant start at my office on the 23rd of March. I met her on her first day, and then we were all locked up in uh, our homes for the best part of the next two months. How do you, how do you build that working relationship when it's uh, and her key role in, within the BMA with the senior leadership team and just making the top of the organization work. And, um, and I think it's, again, it's about being really open about what you're trying to achieve. Um, I did an induction meeting uh, uh, with new staff last week. I absolutely try and prioritize those. And I put the mission statement and the strategy and quite a lot of what we discussed on this call um, absolutely at the at the mission state, uh, sorry, at the induction session, because I think staff need to understand the organisation they've joined as quickly as possible. And one of the, the stats in the poll surveys that we've been looking at, which we can break down by length of service, is actually seeing that the new joiners, are in some ways, even more engaged, and it goes back to your point, Wayne, earlier, what's this organisation I've joined? And wow, what a time to join it. And not just because it's a BMA and, you know, we've been at the centre of quite a lot of things, what a time to join any organisation. And I think one of the things that does worry me is making sure that those staff 
grow as the organization goes on so that's why they put great importance on team meetings put great importance on the intranet um because one of the things i think we're all really missing are the corridor conversations uh the stop and chats the water cooler moments as they you know were called and it's those little incidental conversations so one of the other things that we've tried to do is just make a bit of time at the beginning and end of meetings just have that chit chat it's not the same as sitting next to somebody and saying what about this or did you see that or whatever but again i think really important absolutely right i mean that that um emotional intelligence is something that arguably is is, is lacking in a number you can't kind of teach it i don't think but this is what managers need now more than ever there was there was another um acronym from the u.s army that i had to mention here because i thought it was relevant called vuca i don't know if you know this one but it stands for volatility uncertainty complexity and ambiguity and that's kind of what what we're you know the age we're in now um so linda um perhaps i can come to you now how how what advice would you give to businesses um perhaps you know smaller businesses who are looking to rebrand or brand how important are you know true experts here i think that would be my top tip i think what we've seen through this uncertain time is that um <clears throat> stakeholders um particularly those in the c-suite are valuing marketing brand professionals more they see the value everybody had to switch to digital whether they were there or not very quickly and let's be clear digital marketing digital brand is a science now you know look at seo this is data driven so people that used to think that you could double hat to do this or or that there was a well-intentioned enthusiastic person within the firm that could probably do a bit of marketing i've heard that a million times i see less of that and i hear less of that now so from my perspective i think investing in true professionals now if you're a small business that's very hard because they are not cheap necessarily but there are ways to work around that. There are agencies that you can use as and when you need them. You can look at the talent, which is something that we've just been talking about that's already existing in your, in your business. There may be someone in a, in a past life that has that experience. But I think the most important thing is to recognise it as a, a key skill and, and a profession in its own right. And I certainly think, you know, we've seen a rise in the CMO sort of name of the role uh we certainly are seeing cmos taking on you know ceo roles which is, is never never really been heard of before certainly in our space in, in accountancy we're seeing some of our competitors you know partners uh, who are not um client facing but actually are your brand people your marketing people are being made into partners so there's there's definitely recognition that these people are valuable to the growth of the firm um, and I think that's really important. Double hatting doesn't generally work. And however small you are, you know, there are some really great um, people coming through. They may be interns. They may be um, people who are taking a year out on their on their degree. There are different ways that you can gain that talent, but certainly look for talent around brand and marketing and don't double hat with an enthusiast would be my top tip. And that's really, really great advice there. Um, we're, we're nearly out of time, but Wayne, maybe I can come to you to, to almost sort of wrap us up um, and try and answer the question, bearing in mind where the title is The Global Reset, How to Rebuild a Brand. What will successful businesses in five years look like? What a question. <laughs> well, I guess they'll be in existence. That's the first sign of success. You survived the madness of what we're going through. And we say to a lot of small companies, if you're still around now, uh, you know, post March 2020, you've done pretty great, actually. It's a win. Regarded it as a big win because lots of businesses don't exist anymore, right? So I think the, the transparency has been uh, has been huge over the last few years. You're, you know, if you were in the hospitality sector, for example, and not just hospitality, every organization is reviewed and talked about publicly all the time. So there is nothing much you can hide away from people. Transparency is key, and which is why authentic brands and authentic stories become more and more powerful. You know, so I think the successful organizations, as far as I, if I could make a prediction, would be the ones who can, and this this is in support of what Linda's saying, but a different twist on it, is to say that, yes, you do need the experts involved. We've also recognized that there are a percentage of the, any population 
who would love nothing else than to employ a percentage of their time and energy into helping to build the brand and reputation of the organization. You know, you've probably got on average, what, five to 10% of any population of people based on what we see that, that have a real altruistic bent to them that would want to give of themselves for their own reasons. And, you know, no psychologist, but for their own reasons why they would want to do that. And we've got people who are very, very experienced in doing things like videoing, in things like telling stories, in writing stories, in playwrights. Uh, so we have one organization we worked with, and albeit they're not a very small company, but not massive, they've got 800 people. And they put out an advert internally to ask for anyone to step forward who's got like significant Instagram skills or Snapchat skills, or if you're really cool, some TikTok skills. And what they did was they asked those guys to say, right, we would like five to 10% of your week. We're gonna get you all the equipment and kit you need. And they set up a corner of the office up in Leeds as a TV channel. And they called it, I won't name the name of the company, but they called it the name of the company TV. And they set up their own TV channel producing content. Turns out one of the ladies who worked in the contact center was a part-time actress who'd done a, a, an advert for Virgin. So, you know, you've got someone who's a really, you know, fantastic on camera, really knows what they're doing. And they're utilizing the skills and talents of people. Because remember, most people, if you're working in a contact center, you're going to have a lot of talented, well-educated people who feel frustrated because they can't utilize their skills and experiences. And here's a company that's at one, on one hand being able to leverage those skills and experiences and putting them to use in a way that's helping to uh, bring to life the authenticity and brilliance of their business. I think it's a fantastic example. That is a great example, Wayne, and I think that's a perfect point on which to conclude this session. Clearly, to uh, rebuild, build a brand, um, that transparency, that authenticity is, is, is important for strategies, co-creation, taking people with you, giving them a sense of belonging is, is also critical. Um, I hope that the members of the audience found that discussion as fascinating as I did. If so, I urge you to seek out the other two videos in this series. One looks at achieving growth through adaptability and resilience, and the other is titled Recruiting for Growth in a Hybrid Working World. Please click on the links to learn what insights and advice our experts for real reveal in those two sessions. I'd like to now thank our expert guests for sharing their in insights. Thank you very much uh, to, to all of you. And thanks a lot for joining us. Goodbye for now. <laughs>